Hi, I'm Anna Della Vega and welcome to my very first episode of my series Flute Reboot with Idagio Live. Um, I'm ringing in from Hamburg and I'm so excited to share the wonders of this fascinating instrument with you, which I've been passionate about and in love with since I'm seven years old. The flute has, it has an enormously rich history and function throughout time, which I can't wait to share with you. So why Flute Reboot? The flute is the oldest instrument in the world and it's the only instrument which has appeared in nearly every culture and ethnic group from prehistoric times until today. Um, it's been depicted in, in folk tales, in fables, in myths, in religious texts and cave paintings more than any other instrument throughout history. Yet the flute appears far less frequently to other instruments on the world's concert stage today. So time to re the situation and give the flute a good old reboot. Um, let's look at, at where it has appeared in folk tales and fables um, and religions around the world and more interestingly how it is depicted. It's often given mystical and magical powers, the great seductress, sometimes even almost shamanistic powers. So if we think of Okay, a few examples. If we think of the most famous fables, the Pied Piper of Hamlet, the rats and the children are led to their fate by the sounds of the flute. We go to India and we have the tradition of snake charming, which we all know. And here the flute is hypnotizing and controlling even um, the deadliest of, of creatures. Uh, in Hinduism also you have Krishna, who's depicted holding the flute. In Greek mythology, many of the Greek gods are also associated with the flute. Um, ancient Egyptians um, even believe that the, the voice of the goddess Isis um, could be heard in the sounds of flutes. If we go um, a little bit forward in history, um, Zen Buddhism have a long history of blowing meditation, which is um, the process of bringing the, the mind into deeper states of consciousness through blowing instruments. Again, the flute, see where we're going here. <laughs> um, the mythological depictions of surrounding the shepherd, um, the flute um, is used both to ward off evil and also to keep the, the sheep and the flock together to the shepherd. So if we go now a little bit into more modern history, of course, obviously Mozart's opera, The Magic Flute, where Prince Tamino and Papageno conquer the trials of their journey by use of um, the magic powers of a flute. Um, and lastly, I would say, and really significantly, if you go to early 20th century music, Claude Debussy, Maurice Ravel, they use the, the beauty and the seductiveness and the finesse of this instrument in their depictions of um, l'après-midi of a faun, um, the stories of Pan and Syrinx and Ravel with his Daphne and Chloe. So it's, it's almost, well, very often the flute that is the voice of nymphs and seduction and spirituality um, in these milestone um, mythological works in, in 20th century music in particular. So as we can see, um, the instrument has played a really fundamental, powerful, mystical, magical role to human beings and to art and to storytelling and spirituality since the beginning of time. And if you think that before communication and travel that the flute popped up everywhere all over the world, it's quite phenomenal. Yet how many of us have even heard a flute in recital or a flute concerto in the concert hall? I have, but most of the time it's me blowing the the bloody thing so it's it's not even easy for me to actually hear a flute in concert um so i'm going to explore why this may be there are a few reasons which is also very interesting but for now it's important to to go back to to the beginning firstly i would say about the power and seductive qualities of this instrument i can confirm it i am 
rather like the rats of Hamlin. I was totally done in by a fluke when I was seven years old in an overwhelmingly primordial way, similar to what I've mentioned above. I was headed to a life of riding horses and smoking rolly cigarettes out the back of a horse truck in Australia. Yet when I heard this instrument for the first time, it changed the entire course of my life. And I gave everything I knew and chased that sound um, to Hamburg and to um, a show on Idagio Live. <laughs> so um, before I bomb you with bones and mythology and Byzantine empire trading routes, I wanted to show you what it is that we are celebrating in this series and share with you the very track that changed my life. So that was the king of all kings, my idol, Jean-Pierre Rampal. He will definitely be having an episode all to himself. Um, but for now, back to the beginning and the name of this um, episode, which is Respect Your Elders. So let's pay, pay some respect to the oldest instrument in the world. So findings date back to 43 thousand years ago. Um, and the earliest flutes were found in what is present day Germany. The flutes that were found have been made of giraffe bone leg, vulture bones, mammoth tusks, um, and have provided really history, historians um, like the unmistakable evidence that there was prehistoric music in Europe at that time, which is quite phenomenal. Go the flute. <laughs> but now um, I know I just dropped a bit of a bomb there. Giraffe bone flutes in Germany 43,000 years ago. <laughs> I don't really know what to do about the giraffe bone thing, so I think I'm just going to leave that with you. Um, and here I will show you on my document, if I can control my computer, um, what some of these flutes looked like. Here we go. Okay, there we are. I'm hoping that's working. Okay. Um, so these are the instruments from all those years back, 42,000, 43,000. This is the giraffe bone flute. Okay, and here we have more bone flutes. And you see it pops up everywhere. Here is a wall painting from Northern Mexico, 750 AD. This one looks like me, high ponytail. <laughs> Predating the Aztecs. And here, this one is um, panning, uh, depicted with flute even further back 900 BC. And here from the other side of the world, 500 BC in Cyprus, you have the same thing happening, architecture and so on, you get the picture. So, um, Okay, so let's say that we have arrived to medieval Europe where we have numerous of flutes, nu numerous flutes which have popped up all over the world. They all fall into one of two, um, of one of two categories. We have the open, the open flutes and the closed flutes. So now we get to clarify the age old question which I have gotten many times, which is do I play this flute or do I play this flute. Now, if you're an English speaker straight from Australia, 
arrived in Europe, you don't understand this confusion because it's like, duh, this is the recorder and this is the flute. But if you begin to learn other languages, this is in French, la flûte à bec, and this is la flûte traversier, and in German, Blockflöte and Querflöte. So really until the end of the Renaissance, they were all considered flutes, um, but they were just one of two forms blowing into a chamber, into a mouthpiece like the recorder, or blowing across a hole like the transverse flute. But they sort of split into two families in the late Renaissance, which I will talk about later. So until the mid 14th century, flutes in Europe were mainly the recorder version. And the transverse flute really migrated to Europe during the Byzantine Empire um, from Asia with the Byzantine traders. Um, after which point it was very popular in Germany and actually for a very long time, it became known as the German flute. The transverse was the German flute to distinguish it from, um, from the recorder. So the transverse flute, flute, which is the predecessor to the modern day concert flute, which is what I'm celebrating in this series, had its, so to say, debut in the 1300s with this Byzantine trader movement. Um, but it also had a really interesting wider spread um, um, flourishing in the 14, around 1470, because there was a new military revival in Europe. So why did that help the spread of the flute? The Swiss mercenaries, interestingly enough, used the transverse flute as their main signal in military action. And the, mis the Swiss mercenaries were like a renter army. And so you had these flutes that, that went to all regions of Europe. Um, so these flutes were sort of flung into many corners of Europe and gained more popularity and, and flourished even more. So over the next 200 years, in the 1500s and 1600s, the transverse flute began to appear in religious music also, in court music, in theater music, but it was a very folkish instrument with um, quite a lot of limitations. It was in one piece. Um, but finally in early 1700s, so now we've arrived at the very early Baroque period, a French family, the Hotter family, constructed the one key traverso flute, which was more versatile and agile, easier to travel, airlines are operational and you have any concerts, <laughs> really opening up um, possibilities. And so um, the beginning of the flute's life in Western musical, um, Western classical musical tradition really began. And I'm quickly going to show you those flutes. Um, here we are. Okay, here we have this top one here. We have the Swiss mercenaries. Here, and this is the transverse flute of the Renaissance period. You can see it's in one piece and it's rather limited. And now the Hotter family invented this in three pieces with one key. And after that, everything flourished. That was really the beginning of the flute in classical, in classical um, music as we know it. So I'm really excited to share with you what happened next. The first composition for flute, its role in courts and chamber, its very first appearance in orchestra, Bach, Vivaldi, Telemann, Handel, and do some more listening. So take care. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you next week. Bye.